its first case of the COVID-19 variant first identified in the UK as the province reports more than 2,000 cases and 18 more deaths. And it was a lot of shock, right? Because we were led to believe that she was okay and that the outbreak was managed. But clearly with everything that's come out this past week or so, but it's a really bad situation there. An outbreak at a Scarborough long-term care home continues to worsen as loved ones who've lost family to COVID-19 voice their concerns. I don't think that this virus takes weekends or holidays off. Critics are taking a jab at Ontario officials for pausing vaccinations over Christmas and Boxing Day. Medical experts argue each day counts. Fire crews are battling a five alarm fire tonight. An abandoned building in Toronto's West End went up in flames a few hours ago. Dozens of firefighters are expected to stay on scene overnight. And we begin with that developing story tonight. A five alarm fire raging in Toronto's West End. Given the heavy fire load conditions and both internal and external collapses of the building, the incident commanders transitioned to a defensive attack for the safety of our crews. Uh, the buildings uh, are abandoned. Um, we are currently uh, putting out hotspots right now. And we anticipate being here uh, well into tomorrow morning. About 80 firefighters are battling the blaze at an abandoned building in the area of Dundas West and Sterling Road. No injuries have been reported, but Metrolinx and train services to Barrie have been halted due to the fire, and nearby trees had to be cut down to prevent the flames from spreading. Fire services says the building has been compromised and there's still lots of smoke in the area. The cause of the fire is currently unknown. The province has reported a third case of the COVID-19 variant first discovered in the UK. This recent case was detected in Ottawa in a person who recently travelled to the UK. That brings the number of confirmed cases of this new strain in Canada to four. As CBC's Talia Ricci reports, the new variant is ramping up fears, especially in places that are already hard hit. Experts had warned there were likely more cases of the COVID-19 UK variant in Canada. We now know the first couple who tested positive had a connection to a UK traveller. I think many had expected it and, and noting that the UK had been describing this variant since September. And today, more cases emerged, even beyond Ontario. The Public Health Agency of Canada says the new variant may be significantly more contagious, as early data suggest, but so far there's no evidence it causes more severe illness. It's terrifying news to find out that there's a new strain here when we can't even control the original one. Jessica Wong's grandmother is in an Ontario nursing home overrun by COVID-19. Currently, 128 residents have active cases and 41 people have died at Tender Care Living Centre. Wong's family had been working to get her out. We got the call in the morning that she was in fact tested positive. So we were not able to take her out. We were just too late on that. While the vaccine rollout continues, Wong is desperate for updates on her grandmother's health from overwhelmed staff. If you try calling the, the floor with the nurse, that extension, it's impossible. We're relying on other family members to tell us information at this point, which is pretty sad. Now health authorities and long-term care homes are bracing for this new, more transmissible strain. But when it comes to vaccination, doctors expect the COVID-19 vaccines will still be effective. We manage this with flu every year. The, the vaccine manufacturers have indicated that they'll simply adjust their, the production of their vaccine to take into account new strains. Ontario health officials say large volumes of positive samples are now being screened to investigate how prevalent the variant is here. We'll probably have a much better understanding of other variants, including this variant globally, as genomic tests scale up worldwide. With holiday gatherings, the worry is it could be silently spreading. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Families who've lost loved ones in that outbreak at Tender Care Living Centre are also voicing their concerns. Earlier this week, North York General Hospital stepped in to help control the situation. Wei Lo Lin was a 98-year-old resident who died after contracting the virus. 
Dennis Chu, her grandson, attended her funeral this afternoon. He says his family believes his grandmother's death was avoidable. A week, they assured her, uh, us that they were going to move her up to the fourth floor quarantine unit. Every day they contacted us uh, before her death on Saturday the 19th. She died on the second floor still, so they never moved her. They had told us all week that she was asymptomatic, no fever, no signs, and that she was in good spirits. The only thing on that Saturday, they called my father around 12 after lunch and said that my grandmother didn't eat her lunch, and that was it. And by 4 o'clock, uh, my father got the call that they had found her, and she passed away in her sleep. COVID-19 vaccines were developed at an unprecedented rate, with medical experts suggesting vaccinations are the best way to fight the virus, which is why Ontario is facing criticism for pausing its operation over the holidays. Carolyn Dunn has more on that and how Canada's vaccine rollout compares to other countries. In Quebec, vaccinations continued right through the holiday. Thousands got the jab over Christmas. By contrast, Ontario stopped vaccinations altogether for Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Today, just five hospital clinics opened. Tomorrow, five more. The pause was necessary, a spokesperson says, to ensure there was no impact on staffing levels at long-term care homes and hospitals. But critics say every day counts. I don't think that this virus takes weekends or holidays off. And I know how dedicated the healthcare workers are in this province, that they would be there to vaccinate at all hours. So let's make it happen. Alberta is vaccinating every day except Christmas and New Year's Day. Oxford University tracked global data and found Canada's vaccination rate falls short of others. By Christmas Eve in Canada, just 0.12 people per 100 had received a vaccine. Russia, the U.S. and the U.K. far outpaced that. And Israel and Bahrain are global leaders, having vaccinated more than three people in every hundred. Today, 27 nations in the European Union joined the race to vaccinate. A 20-year-old German pilot flew his plane in the shape of a syringe to celebrate. The vaccines are rolling out now and uh, maybe an inspiration for people to think about it. This 101-year-old in Berlin didn't have to think long. She joined people from Portugal to Poland, getting first jabs aimed at long-term care home residents and their health care workers. Greece's prime minister declared the procedure painless. The EU has set an ambitious goal of vaccinating 450 million people. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And there's a live look at Windsor for you tonight where it is four degrees and the Ambassador Bridge all lit up in the distance there. Let's check in with Christina for a look at our forecast. So a few degrees above zero, that's pretty good for winter. Absolutely, but we've got a system on the way, Maryville. Okay, so we're dropping. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We've got some cold Arctic air coming midweek as well. But first, let's tackle this system overnight. You're seeing here into our overnight, midnight, pre-dawn hours, we're going to be dealing with this consistent precip. So rain primarily for Toronto, but you're seeing here into uh, Oshawa, Newmarket, Kitchener, Hamilton, Barrie, through the higher terrains, here comes that mixing and then some heavy snowfall too. So here is that low pressure system. Higher terrains, as I mentioned, heavy snowfall, southern Ontario from Windsor all the way to London, Toronto, Barrie. It's going to be rain, it's going to be snow, and it's going to be some mixing too. So much so that Environment Canada has issued special weather statements. Uh, we are going to be dealing with brief periods of freezing rain for this evening, as well as some snowfall really into our Monday as well as our Tuesday. And then 5 to 10 centimeters of snowfall for this evening is going to be changing into that rainfall for your Monday. A quick look at your Monday afternoon high Toronto. There is your rainfall four degrees. London pushing into Windsor. A little bit of that mixing and then pushing north. It's all about those colder temperatures and more snowfall on the way. As you can see here right through that 401 corridor more rainfall. But you got to come back for the long range forecast because we've got a system and it's going to be affecting our new year. Okay so we'll see you in a few minutes then. Thanks Christina. Okay. Great thanks. 
Well, it's been a difficult holiday season for many people, not able to see family and friends in person because of the pandemic. It's a reality that many international students at the University of Toronto are dealing with right now, forced to spend the holidays in their dorm rooms because of travel restrictions or simply because they just didn't want to put family members at risk. Greg Ross connected with some of them today. Yeah, every year I've gone home during the holidays. For third year U of T student Jonathan Blaze, home is Trinidad and Tobago. And because of the pandemic, he hasn't been there all year. Now he's spending his first Christmas away from his family and the comforts of home. It definitely would be nice, you know, like hot sun, home cooked food with my family. Christmas in Trinidad is very different to Christmas here, so it's a little bit of a culture shock as well. Blay says he would have been forced to quarantine for two weeks if he traveled home, and then another two weeks upon arriving back in Canada, time he simply could not afford. So like many of us this year, his only option was to connect with his family online. Um, tried to have like a Christmas Zoom call with my family, but like, I don't know if you've ever been on a Zoom call with six people and they all talk at the same time. It's not very easy to do. So yeah, it's definitely difficult to have those connections with your family when, you know, they live so far away. Blay says the pandemic has been difficult for students in general, but for those left behind in dorms during the holidays, it's been particularly tough. It's isolating. It can definitely be lonely for students. Um, I think a lot of people aren't really accustomed just being by themselves, like period. Um, but especially during a time where you are accustomed being with your family. Under normal circumstances, the school would have offered those students a holiday dinner. Not this year. Unfortunately, this year they don't have the opportunity to dine all together in, um, in the dining hall. But so the school has looked at other ways to help students connect. A lot of online events, a lot of online um, programming. They've also offered other forms of support for students who need it. But we also have um, on-location counselors if students um, um, want to reach out for mental health resources. Blay says he's taken on a leadership role in his dorm, and while he's been able to provide support for students, he says he's also gotten plenty in return. We talk about this thing about like second families, so um, I've definitely been able to find that community here, so it hasn't been that bad. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. I was a fanatical diary keeper when I was a little kid, so I knew right away, I was like, oh yeah, this is totally me, that was no question. A long lost diary is making its way back to its owner decades later. The story of that reunion coming up, plus. Quarantine, quarantine thing turned lifelong love <laughs> it goes without saying that 2020 has been a hard year tough enough to fall in love without a pandemic but some couples still manage to find romance in the time of covid their stories after the break
It's a tale of past meets present. A lost diary, once belonging to a young girl in Toronto, found in a crawl space. 30 years later, returned to its rightful owner in Vancouver. Dahlia Ashry has all the details. It's not every day you get a chance to be reunited with your childhood diary. It was once a Christmas gift to nine-year-old Allison Jenkins. Over 30 years later, an unexpected Christmas gift. As soon as I saw the picture of the diaries, I was like, oh my God, that's my writing. <laughs> and I was a fanatical diary keeper. A little Christmas present that's going to come just a few days after Christmas Day. Nick Gunz's parents found these notebooks and diary in their crawl space. As a historian, Gunz says his curiosity made him take the books home. I put it on a shelf, kind of forgot about it. And then uh, with the holidays, we had time off. So we started clearing out the living room and I found these things on a shelf. And I went, you know what? I'm just going to take a picture of it, send out a tweet, see what happens. He tweeted, Alison Jenkins, we have your top secret notebook from when you were 10 in 1983. It went viral with over 800 retweets. Jenkins, who now lives in Vancouver, says people made her aware of the tweet. She connected with Gunz. Turns out they share more than just the same childhood home. It turns out we both went to Islington Junior Middle School in Toronto. He had lived there like he had moved in either right after we moved out of the house or, or within a couple of years and had grown up there. And so I sent him a picture of me sitting in one of the bedrooms and a picture of what the house looked like on the outside. Oh, Jenkins says she has enjoyed writing from a young age. Now a singer, songwriter and music teacher who writes her own lyrics. Maybe a kickstart for her next song. It'll be nice inspiration to have the uh, the diaries for sure. After three decades, Gunz doesn't plan to keep Jenkins waiting much longer. I'm going to uh, put them in an envelope and send them out to her address, um, which was the, the, the point in the first place. Uh, and I, I really hope that the books have um, fond memories for her. And I had a very happy childhood, so there was probably not a lot of drama, but I'm sure I manufactured some. <laughs> So I can't wait to see what I wrote in there. It's going to be really fun. Dahlia Ashry, CBC News, Toronto. What a great story. Well, when it comes to dating during a pandemic, there are ways to put yourself out there without going outside. Some Toronto couples have found love during lockdown. Natalie Collada brings us their stories. Quarantine, quarantine thing turned lifelong love. <laughs> so we first started talking like during the first lockdown. One of our first few days are actually video dates. I think I preferred it because there's kind of less pressure if you, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I don't have to kiss someone I meet on the first date because it wouldn't be sensible. And I think now that we're like together, we both wish we could like, you know, go out and dance together and do some stuff like that. but. Um, I kind of, I'm happy that we didn't have that because I don't feel like we would have connected the same way. We got to know each other faster, but it was like more um, thorough. I think what's been great for us for COVID is we've kind of been there for each other. Um, like even when we were like just doing our like video calls, um, like we're both working full time. So like after work, we'd like have a beer together on our video call and like kind of like bent about the day. I think it really just shifted people's perspective. People felt that uh, they really wanted to stop playing games and get more serious. And I think it just was a really a time for people to really reflect on their dating lives and, and what really mattered to them, and what they really wanted out of it. Being in COVID, you know, you get a lot of, you know, time to yourself and, you know, you're const you're not constantly hanging out with friends. So when you take that away and you're, you're by yourself a lot, you're like, you know what, I, I really want, you know, someone to sp share this time with. And quickly, like, I was seeing her more than most of my friends. So it was like interesting in a way that like we had, we couldn't really go like two places. We went to like hung a lot of parks. So normally yeah. you could just go to a restaurant, but there weren't really any restaurants. So we had to get a little bit creative about um, what we could do really. We went uh, to the zoo once. Um, Rachel set up a Segway tour early on. He's kind of moved in for these two, two weeks, which yeah. is, uh, yeah, probably something that wouldn't happen normally. You adapt and you make the best of it. I think you definitely are. 
hope that warmed your heart a little. This is a live look at Parliament Hill in Ottawa. It is minus four degrees there right now. Christina will be back with your long range forecast after the break. famous festive song got more plays than ever this year. To tell us more about how people are streaming through the holidays, here's arts reporter Yelena Adzik with a little help from Mariah Carey. All I want for Christmas is you. That's what Mariah Carey says, and that's what we're listening to over and over again. I'm going to give you a look at a tweet, a social post, actually, that she sent out for the holidays and share a little bit about the fact that her song, All I Want for Christmas is You, has been downloaded, as streamed, rather, over 17 million times on Christmas Eve alone. It was already, earlier this month, it scooped the number one spot on Billboard's Hot 100 list. 
So this is a song that is about 26 years old, and it is still going strong. She's incorporated this as part of a Christmas special for Apple, and this is something that Mariah Carey is gaining some money off of, obviously, with the royalties, but it is worth noting that Spotify, with its streaming, is still paying only about half a penny to three quarters of a penny per stream for artists. So you can imagine what lower tier artists that aren't as well known would be making. Mariah Carey is doing all right, but she's kind of keen on pointing out that Spotify is being a bit of a Grinch this Christmas when it comes to giving artists their due. I'm going to share a tweet that she sent out. She said, wow, I know people think I'm making coin little secret artists make very little from streams but the real reason i'm sitting here in astonishment and gratitude is seeing the joy this little song i wrote brings to people thank you and merry christmas yelena adzik cbc news toronto christina tell me you know all the words to I mariah carey's christmas mary song. Val, i'm guilty i was gonna tell you that's my favorite too yeah, same. So we were one of the 17 million streams on Christmas Eve. <laughs> you got it. So from Christmas Eve, I'm taking you to New Year's okay. Eve because we got some weather coming our way. <laughs> okay, so Monday morning, four degrees. Here is that rainfall from that system we're talking about. But it's also, as we mentioned, going to get a lot colder with that cold Arctic air. Come Monday evening, Toronto feeling like minus 15. Tuesday morning, Toronto feeling like minus 15. Windsor minus 14. North Bay minus 20. So some cold Arctic air is a prelude of another system on the way. Actually, we've got two systems on the way. So December 29th and 30th, here comes in this Colorado low, but that's not going to bring us a lot of moisture. What is, is this Texas low just in time for New Year's Eve and then New Year's Day. Now this Texas low is going to bring us some heavy moisture. Let's take a look at the week ahead, your Monday. There is your rainfall from that system we're seeing overnight into our Monday. Tuesday, Toronto, we're gonna have clearer skies. It starts to get colder. Wednesday, here come the flurries. And then Thursday, your New Year's Eve rain. Friday, that mixture of rain and snow. And then that continues into our Saturday, into the nation's capital where we saw those beautiful visuals. Monday, here is your mixing. Tuesday, feeling like minus 14, getting cold. Here is that beautiful sunshine. And then here is your flurries for your Wednesday. So New Year's Eve, you're mixing New Year's Day 2021. We're starting off the new year with flurries and to Barrie, Ontario we go. So Monday, here is your mixing. But Barrie does not get a break because the flurries continue for your Tuesday, your Wednesday, Thursday, New Year's Eve, mixing for everybody in Barrie. And then Friday, snowfall right at the freezing mark, feeling like minus five. Saturday, clear skies. And then Sunday, here comes that snowfall. And I wish everybody a happy new year and I'll be seeing you again next year. Exactly. To 2021 <laughs> then. Thanks, To 2021. Christina. See you. Bye-bye. Well, stripping insulation off of copper wires is tough, grueling work. But one woman from Yellowknife is determined to do it as much as possible for a good cause. In 2019, a former employer gave Diane Hashi three shipping containers of used copper wire to sell and donate to charity. She could sell it as is, but removing the insulation doubles the value of the copper. Has she spent all last winter in this tent with just a propane heater working alone? They said, Diane, that's impossible to do, but impossible is just an opinion until you try. Well, she sold 38,000 pounds of copper, the weight of about six pickup trucks. This fall, she presented a $94,000 check to the Yellowknife Women's Society. As she says, her work is far from over. She hopes to donate even more. And that's the holiday spirit for you. That's our show for you tonight. Thank you for watching. You can stay caught up on news anytime on our website, cbcnews.ca. Have a great night and stay safe out there, everyone.